This verse confirms Krishna's all attractiveness. Maharaj Bharata was so attracted to Krishna that he gave up all his material possessions. Generally, materialistic people are attracted by such possessions. Ato griha shetra sutapta vitayar janashyamo hoyam ahamameti. One becomes attracted to his body, home, property, children, relatives, and wealth. In this way, one increases life's illusions and thinks in terms of I and mine. The attraction for material things is certainly due to illusion. There is no value in attraction to material things. For the conditioned soul is diverted by them. Mm. Yeah, that's the, that's the problem right there. That's the problem. Become diverted or distracted by these things. The conditioned soul becomes diverted and attracted to these things and thinks in terms of it's a mine, it's I, it's mine. I and mine, it's mine to enjoy for my senses, for my gratification, for my glorification, for my pleasure. <laughs> Me, the center of it all, just like Krishna. <laughs> and it's an illusion. It was all based on the body. And they may stay in that situation for some time, but it's like that game kids play, King of the Hill. You get up on top of the hill, and then you just get pushed off. It all gets taken away. If not before the time of death, definitely at the time of death, it all gets taken away. And then where do you go? You still have all those desires. Where do we go? We still have all those desires. So that's why it's an illusion. It's a distraction from Krishna. But when someone like Maharaj Bharata became conscious of Krishna and Krishna's opulences, then his own position became clear to him and his attraction for those things as him being the center and him being the enjoyer of all his temporary things it no longer held any attraction for him. He wasn't bewildered by it. And he was even able to just give it all up and go to the forest, meditate on Krishna. One's life is successful if he is absorbed in the attraction of Krishna's strength, beauty, and pastimes, as described in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah, this is what Sukadeva Goswami is building up to. There are 12 cantos. The first nine cantos, and we're in canto five, are giving us information about Krishna, his power, who he is, his different incarnations, and the different devotees and how they were approaching Krishna. It's giving us the history of creation. He's giving us the science of creation and taking us through the different different uh, aspects of, of Krishna till we get to the point of his smiling face or his actual intimate personality. And that's where Sukadeva is taking Maharaj Parikshit. And that's where we're headed when we go along with them as they take this progression to actually reveal the sweetness and the intimate nature of Krishna as the personality of God at his loving propensity. So, <clears throat> one's life is successful if he's absorbed in the attraction of Krishna's strength, beauty, and pastimes, as described in the 10th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. The Mayavadis are attracted to merging into the existence of the Lord, but Krishna is more attractive than the desire to merge. 
The word abhava means not to take birth again in this material world. A devotee does not care whether he is going to be born or not. He is simply satisfied with the Lord's service in any condition. That's real mukti. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. A devotee doesn't care whether he's going to be reborn or not. Usually that's the, the big impetus for um, liberation and salvation is not to be reborn again, not to take birth in the material world. But where they're going, they don't know. But I know they want to get out of here. Let's get out of here and then we'll worry about, you know, other things later, but let's just get out. And that gets that, that desire. They act in such a way to get out of the clutches of the modes of nature, but without being attached to the personality of Godhead, the spiritual being who is maintaining everything and is the source of everything then they're not qualified to associate with him because associating with Krishna means devotional service, devotional energy, divine energy. You're not qualified to enter the divine energy, the devotional energy. So there's arrangement for such people and they hang out in what's called the effulgence or the glowing spiritual nature. It's undifferentiated nature, undifferentiated spiritual energy. They get to hang out in there for a while. The Prabhupada's saying here, the real devotee only wants to connect through devotional service with the Lord, and if it means taking birth in the material world, then they really don't care if they have to accept another material vehicle. They don't care what kind of vehicle they have if they're engaged in devotional service, this is a pure devotee, then they can go anywhere because they're, in, they're engaged in the divine energy. And if Krishna has some service to do in the material world, then they're more than, more than happy to serve in that way. So that mentality certainly can't be imitated. <laughs> But by hearing like this, we can understand that that is, that is the, the uh, mentality, that is the um, consciousness of a pure devotee, is they actually don't care what kind of vehicle they get, as long as they can serve the Lord. Hearing, chanting, remembering, offering prayers, making friends with serving the lotus feet, worshiping, serving, making and offering everything to the Lord. If they can engage in the processes and activities of devotional service, they're with Krishna. So, what <clears throat> Chaitanya prays like that in Shikshastika. Lifetime after lifetime, you engage in your devotional service. Even if you leave me brokenhearted, not present before me, you still my worshipful Lord unconditionally. So that's real mukti. Iha yasya harer dasye karmana manasagira nikilasvap yastasu jivan muktasa uchite. One who acts to serve Krishna with body, mind, and intelligence and words is a liberated person, even within this material world. A person who always desires to serve Krishna is interested in ways to convince people that there is a Supreme Personality of Godhead and that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is Krishna. That is his ambition. It doesn't matter whether he's in heaven or in hell. That's called Uttama Sloka Lalasa. Hmm. 
in the time. Prabhupada said that pure devotees like a cow. Wherever you put them, they give milk. He also said like a typewriter. If the typewriter is in the material world, it goes clickety clackety clack. If it's in the spiritual world, the typewriter goes. So a devotee is like that. Wherever they are, serving Krishna. And Prabhupada's very specific here that a person who always desires to serve Krishna is interested in ways to convince people that there is a Supreme Personality of God in. That's his ambition. It doesn't matter if he's in the heavenly planets or he's in the hellish planets. He wants to convince people. Why? Because Krishna wants people to be convinced of his existence. And how does that convincing come? Well, Krishna is within the heart. And when one gets a taste for devotional service, and they compare it to the taste of the material activities, then it's not necessary to even convince them anymore, become attracted. And that attraction and that pleasure that they're experiencing is convincing. Another way that's described is, um, so when Prabhupada says he wants to convince people, it means he wants to give them a, t a taste. He wants to let them have a taste. He, he, uh, he used the example also of if a person is hungry and they have food to eat, then because the food is satisfying them, there's no need to convince them that they're not hungry anymore because they've, the food itself is, sat is convincing has convinced them. They're convinced because they're experiencing. So in the previous verse, Prabhupada was saying how the Hare Krishna movement is giving opportunity to people to engage in devotional service, even for a little while, so they can become convinced of Krishna. And then if they if they're can't maintain, then that's another thing. But whatever they've done stays with them and eventually the taste for devotional service becomes stronger than any other taste. It may take lifetimes for some, but the process has begun, at least it's begun. Text 45. Even though in the body of a deer, Maharaj Bharata did not forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead, therefore when he was giving up the body of a deer, he loudly uttered the following prayer. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is sacrifice personified. He gives the results of ritualistic activity. He's the protector of religious systems, the personification of mystic yoga, the source of all knowledge, the controller of the entire creation, and the super soul in every living entity. He's beautiful and attractive I'm quitting this body, offering obeisances unto him, hoping I may perpetually engage in his transcendental loving service. Uttering this, Maharaj Bharata left his body. Whew. What a way to go. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Prabhupada's commentary. The entire Vedas are meant for understanding of karma, jnana, and yoga. Fruit of activity, speculative knowledge, and mystic yoga. Whatever way of spiritual realization we accept, the ultimate goal is Narayan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The living entities are eternally connected with him via devotional service. As stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, Ante Narayan Ashmiti, the perfection of life is to remember Narayan at the time of death. Although Bharat Maharaj had to accept the body of a deer, he could remember Narayan at the time of death. Consequently, he took birth, birth as a perfect devotee in a Brahmin family. This confirms the statement of Bhagavad Gita, Suchinam Srimate Gehe, Yoga Brashtad Bijayate. 
One who falls from the path of self-realization takes birth in a family of Brahmins or wealthy aristocrats. Although Maharaj Bharata appeared in a royal family, he became neglectful and took birth as a deer. Because he was very cautious within his deer body, he took birth in a Brahmin family as Jad Bharat. During this lifetime, he remained perfectly Krishna conscious and preached the gospel of Krishna consciousness directly, beginning with his instructions to Maharaj Rahugana. In this word, the word yogaya is very significant, and the purpose of Astanga Yoga, as stated by Madhvacharya, is to link or connect with the personality of Godhead. The goal is not to display some material perfections. Hmm. Yeah. <sighs> Food of activity, speculative knowledge, and mystic yoga. The ultimate goal is Narayan, shelter of all living entities. And we see that from his prayer as he was leaving the deer's body. He, he saw that. He could understand that. He said he loudly uttered the following prayer. Now, loudly uttered. Um, Loudly uttered? Well, we don't know the miracles that he was able to speak like that as a deer, or loudly internally, he, because he was able to remember, so internally he spoke like that, internally. Because obviously his mind was he was able to remember everything. So within within himself he spoke. It must be. Hmm. Hmm. And he offers that prayer. I may perpetually engage in his transcendental loving service. So even within the deer's body, by remembering like that, he was in touch with the divine energy, although he was very limited in what he could display as a deer or who he could influence as a deer. He was very limited. But within, he was engaging in devotional service because he was remembering. He was remembering Narayan as a deer. He was engaged in devotional service. It's just the vehicle that he had was not suitable for really doing much of anything. Hmm. And then he received the, uh, took birth as a Brahmin. He had more opportunity to do things, but he chose not to. He could have influenced a lot of people. He could have become a very perfect Brahmin but he chose not to make any material display of any kind of material perfection and simply remember the Lord within the heart. Something like what he had done as a deer. That's what he was doing in the deer's body. He had no attraction whatsoever for engaging in the material energy. No attraction for Varnashram Dharma, no attraction, although these things all serve a purpose, they're not to be disregarded, but this particular devotee had reached such a level of transcendence in relationship to the Lord that there was no need for any of that. He was not making any external display of anything material. He was simply absorbed in Krishna consciousness. And he was accepting whatever came for the maintenance of that body. 
something like what he had done as a deer. The deer just hops around and eats what little things here and there. Hmm. It appears that he learned something incredible in that deer's body, something very incredible about renunciation. Hmm. And detachment from identifying with the body as a self. So it appears that he made a mistake and it was, he fell down, he was practicing his rituals and his practices in the forest. And he was doing them very nicely. But it appears he wasn't making the kind of advancement he needed to make in order to really go back home, back to Godhead. And so this fall down when he got attached to the deer, it actually served as a great blessing and that lifetime as a deer's body turned out to be a kind of benediction so that when he resumed his devotional service, he was on a much higher platform of desire for Krishna, so much so that he had no desire for anything material at all, could not be distracted, would not allow himself to be distracted from Krishna, not for a moment, no matter what, even to the point where he had been captured by the uh, band of thieves and was going to be used as a sacrificial offering, he didn't protest, he just depended on Krishna. Whew. He had understood the goal. The goal is not to display some material perfection. Mm. Text 46, and this is the last verse in this chapter. Sukadev continues, Devotees interested in hearing and chanting Shravanam Kirtana regularly discuss the pure characteristics of Bharat Maharaj and praises activities. If one submissively hears and chants about the all auspicious Maharaj Bharata, one's lifespan and material opulences certainly increase. <laughs> one can become very famous and easily attain promotion to heavenly planets or attain liberation by merging into the existence of the Lord. Oh goodness, <laughs> we don't want those things. Whatever one desires can be attained simply by hearing, chanting, and glorifying the activities of Maharaj Bharata. <laughs> In this way, one can fulfill all his material and spiritual desires. One does not have to ask anyone else for anything, for simply by studying the life of Maharaj Bharata, one can attain all these desirable things. Okay, so if that's what someone wants, then that's there too. But the real takeaway on this is to reach a desire to have a, a level of remembrance and, and focus and like Maharaj Bhar Bharata. But what, what's being said here, Sukadeva is saying that all these things come automatically. But we have to be careful what we desire. <laughs> so we should desire the real benediction here, which is pure devotional service. But it's so auspicious to hear about this, is what's being said. Even materially, it's so auspicious. Prabhupada's commentary, the forest of material existence is summarized in this 14th chapter. The word bhava-tavi refers to the path of material existence. The merchant is the living entity who comes to the forest of material existence to try to make money for sense gratification. The six plunderers are the senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, touch, and mind. The bad leader is diverted intelligence. Intelligence is meant for Krishna consciousness 
but due to material existence, we divert all our intelligence to achieve material facilities. Everything belongs to Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but due to our perverted mind and senses, we plunder the property of the Lord and engage in satisfying our senses. The jackals and tigers in the forest are our family members, and the herbs and creepers are our material desires. So Prabhupada's giving a little synopsis here of what's been discussed in the 14th chapter. The mountain cave is our happy home, and the mosquitoes and serpents are our enemies. The rats, beasts, and vultures are different types of thieves who take away our possessions, and the Gandhavapura is the phantasmagoria of the body and home. The will of the wisp is our attraction for gold and its color, and material residence and wealth are the ingredients of our material enjoyment. The whirlwind is our attraction for our wife, and the dust storm is our blinding passion experiencing during sex. The demigods control the different directions, and the cricket is the harsh word spoken by our enemy during our absence. The owl is the person who directly insults us, and the impious trees are impious men. The waterless river represents atheists who give us trouble in this world and the next. And the meat-eating demons are the government officials the pricking thorns are the impediments of material life. The little taste experienced in sex is our desire to enjoy another's wife, and the flies are the guardians of women, like the husband, father-in-law, mother-in-law, and so forth. The creeper itself is women in general. The lion is the wheel of time, and the herons, crows, and vultures are so-called demigods, pseudo-swamis, yogis, and incarnations. All of these are too insignificant to give one relief. The swans are the perfect Brahmins, and the monkeys are the extravagant suitors engaged in eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. The trees are the monkeys. The trees of the monkeys are our households, and the elephant is ultimate death. Thus, all the constituents of material existence are described in this chapter. And that is the forest of material existence. Very dangerous place. Jai. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fifth canto, 14th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Material World as the Great Forest of Enjoyment. <laughs>